Welcome and thank you for joining us for another episode of the Jane Irrigation Training Series. And uh, this week, we're going to be talking about the wonderful life of a dying tree. And as I received some questions from people about what does this have to do with irrigation, uh, you know, one thing I try to remind everybody is that the mission statement for Jane is leave this world better than you found it. And certainly the founder of Jane, when he founded the company, he was very interested in doing good things for both humans and wildlife. So I find this really to be in our in our niche of things to talk about. And uh, we're so lucky to have uh, Jillian Martin talking with us today about this. You know, uh, Jillian's a um, well-known speaker and writer about conservation and wildlife, and it fits really well with, uh, with what we like to talk about and what we're passionate about. Um, I've seen this presentation before a few months ago. She did this presentation to some master gardeners in San Diego, and I just liked it so much. I wanted to share it with all of you because she's really a dynamic speaker and very interesting. And it really opened up a whole new world of uh, wildlife to me. I've uh, since uh, actually had to do a couple tree removals on my property and uh, she influenced the way I did it from her presentation. And, uh, and I left some things in place that I wouldn't normally have and I'm so happy I did it now. So uh, uh, Jillian, uh, welcome, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Richard. And thank you to everyone for being here this afternoon. I've really looked forward to being with you all. You're a novel audience for me. <laughs> and and um, I, you know, I'm assuming that you must be very curious people. I have great respect for people who are curious because to show up for this topic really requires exceptional curiosity. <laughs> As we all know, you know, curiosity can lead us down into new and inspiring paths. And that's certainly what it has done for me in my life. And I also assume that because you're here, you may be already a little convinced of the habitat value of dead trees. So I'm here just to confirm that intuition in your mind and also to ignite you with enthusiasm over dead trees so that when you leave today, your radar will be up for dead trees and you'll be looking for opportunities to observe them and perhaps save them uh, safely in place if possible. Um, before I go on, I also want to acknowledge for everyone that my, my experience with dead trees is pretty much limited to the Western region of the United States, the states in the Western region, and uh, most spe specifically California. Obviously, um, types of habitats and types of species vary by region, but I'm pretty confident that the, the takeaways will be valuable to you wherever you are. Okay. <clears throat> So here's what I'm going to cover. I'm going to talk about the di a dying tree's habitat value over time in natural forests. In other words, what did nature have in mind for a tree, you know, before development came along and changed the rules about tree management? Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the important role played by primary excavators relative to dead trees, and that, that we're talking about woodpeckers in this case. Then I'm going to be going over the many associations wildlife have with dead trees. And then the, the very practical part, considerations when selecting and managing what we call a habitat tree. We consider a, when a dead tree is saved specifically for habitat and managed for it, we consider it a habitat tree. Okay, so here's a lovely illustration done by an artist friend, who, um, which talk, which shows what nature had in mind for trees, you know, for the, for the whole span of their lifetime. Um, you know, I always say that the trees are designed to have two lives, one when they're healthy and, 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 and mature and so on, and another one when they start to die. And um, it's usually, you know, common, commonly thought that a tree's habitat value is only, is at its best, of course, when it's mature and it's reached its full, um, you know, canopy size and so on. Um, and that many people think that when a tree starts to do what this middle tree does, is showing right here, that the, that the tree is in decline and therefore losing its value and maybe we should start thinking of removing it and replacing it. And they certainly do think that generally speaking, if I make generalizations of when a tree is in this condition and this condition, right? And, and of course, downward is often given any thought at all. But what I'm here to convey is that um, 
Mother Nature has a very commendable destiny in mind for, for trees when they die. And then there's a whole suite of organisms that are designed uh, to benefit from trees as they start to fail, to you know, decay and so on. And in every successional stage of its decline, there are organisms that play a role with these trees, have associations with them. And of course, the ultimate task, the ultimate role of these organisms is to return when, when wood falls to the ground, to return the nutrients to soil. So consider for a moment when we, when we remove a tree at, at its base here, in like the center tree or here, the, the third one from the right, um, we're depriving the tree of that whole commendable destiny, that whole legacy that is supposed to leave. And, and, and then consider that, you know, in some places, trees take a long time to decay and some sp species more so than others. So it may take a tree 50 or 100, more, more than 100 years to decay. So look at all the habitat value we're removing when we remove a tree at its stump. <laughs> so the organisms I mentioned previously that are designed to benefit from their trees, um, we can start with the insects, right? Their job is to cull weak trees from the forest, either the urban forest or the natural forest systems, and get them ready for their final resting place, which is the soil. And so these organisms leave, when they usually um, nest in the trees, they usually leave exit holes of different sizes and shapes. But these organisms are things like bark and wood boring beetles, clear winged boring moths, wood wasps, termites, and flies. But of course, you I'm sure you are familiar with the, with the role of saprophytic fungi. Their job is to break down dead and decaying matter. And of course, that includes trees, right? To give them back to the soil as well. But the interesting thing, which is out of view of most people, is that their whole suite of insects that benefit from the fruiting bodies of these fungi. And here we see on the left some flies, I don't know what species of flies, are feeding on the, the um, the, 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 what we think of the mushrooms, right? But there's a whole another set of insects that, are, that, go, that go inside the fruiting bodies and nest in there. And then there's others that come in after them to predate on those nesting in there. So sometimes they're little mini ecosystems. And then of course, spiders being sometimes as wise as they are, would know to spring their webs under these fruiting canopies, right, for shelter, because they know somehow into, uh, intuitively that insects are coming and going. So they're trapping the insects there. And of course, you know, the hummingbird who eats a lot of insects will come along and pluck the insect from the web and take some of the web uh, to its nest to build it. So, I mean, you know, in nature, everything is useful to some or more, more organisms. But as you know, uh, you know, the, trees get injured and, and or attacked by pathogens or whatever and the decay forms in trees so sometimes the decay is visible to us as in the form of a large cavity like this in the large trunk sometimes it's not visible it's inside the tree as in the form of hardwood rot so the the um, organisms that are larger to benefit of course and need the larger cavities the barn owl is one of the classic examples but there are mammals also that nest or den in, in large cavities in trees. But then living trees sometimes have a dead limb, right? And that dead, uh, that dead limb sometimes has decay in it. So when the tree care providers come, da come down and remove that dead limb, sometimes it exposes a cavity, which is then useful to wildlife. And then the, the, the roots and the boles of trees sometimes get injured or um, infected with pathogens and decay forms there. And those, those um, cavities at the base of the tree are used by obviously by mammals and small rodents and <clears throat> probably other organisms that I don't even know about. So um, cavities form in trees at all levels. Um, but primary excavators, which are the woodpeckers, are the ones that excavate their own cavities. They, they don't, uh, they, uh, it's, it would be rare for a woodpecker in North America to use a natural cavity. Um, so where they exist, they are really key to forest health and diversity um, because they provide so many ecological benefits that other cavity nesters, what we call secondary cavity nesters, those that can't make their own cavities, um, uh, benefit from, and th they can then occupy those habitats where without woodpeckers, they might not be there or might not be able to. So that's, that's an hour long presentation that I 
can do with great animation. I love that topic. But anyway, so in North America, we have, uh, we have um, about 80 cavity nesting birds. And um, finally, uh, one scientific study brought the answer I've been wanting for a long time, and that is, how many, how many um, cavities made by woodpeckers are used by secondary cavity nesters? Because you know, they can obviously use natural cavities too, right? So the study said about 77% of cavities used um, made by woodpeckers are used by non-excavators. So that is a peckers that most people don't know about is that they're agents of forest succession and they support the health of urban forests and natural forests. And what do I mean by that? Well, it means that they are actually, they act as vectors of fungi and invertebrate, invertebrates that break down wood. So think about this, here's a dead tree and you, you notice the, the fruiting bodies of fungi right here. So picture how these woodpeckers move up and down this tree and their bodies and bills and heads are brushing up against these fungal spores. And so, so they're, they're picking up the fungal spores and any other insects that are there breaking down the tree, right? So they're, as they hitch up and down the tree, they're transporting those agents to other parts of their tree. And also as they visit other declining trees, they do the same thing. So woodpeckers are helping their own, their own uh, cause, but in, in essence, they're helping to to pass those, um, those saprocytic organisms onto other trees to help break down the trees so the trees can eventually decay and also open up the forest for new growth to appear. So they're very, very important organisms for lots of reasons. And of course, dead trees have lots and lots of insects. And we have woodpeckers that specialize in insects at all, in, in all types of trees and in all levels of decay. You know, we have those that go after the wood boring, um, the wood boring beetle lava. We have those that just uh, glean the surface of bark or probe just, just right into the, the, um, the sapwood. It has a bill with a full of insects. And we have woodpeckers that specialize in downwood and even those in the soil. So in doing this, they are exposing, not only feeding themselves and their young, but they're exposing insects to other organisms that wouldn't have access to those sources of insects. Here are two examples. The red start, you see gleaning insects from here, and even the hummingbird probing um, uh, behind loose bark. All right, so one of the most unappreciated values of dead trees is the fact that they provide unobstructed views. Um, so why is an unobstructed view helpful? Well, because they are great purchase for hunting, you've, I'm sure you've seen raptors at the top of, tippy top of trees, live trees as well. Um, they use it for hunting, for watching prey flying by or prey on the ground. They also bring their prey back to the perches to, to eat. They use them for, uh, birds use them for territorial defense, for courtship and for capturing insects in flight, passing by. So think about this. I mean, who, who gets to defend their territory, gets all the recess resources in that territory, and who gets the girl, gets their genes passed on. So an unobstructed view is very helpful. Then also dead trees, because of this unobstructed view, um, are serve um, flocks of birds in migration. These are cliff swallows, and you can see them all gathering here. These, are, these trees serve as staging areas prior to migration, and sometimes as, as birds move along the, the flyway and come down to rest, these are roosting sites for them. And they also, by sticking together these flocks on these, on these exposed branches, they monitor the foraging, foraging success of their flock mates so they can see who's successful at finding food and who's not, and which benefits the whole flock. And of course, because dead wood is soft, they're great places to store food, right? So you're probably familiar with the iconic um, acorn woodpecker gets its name uh, um, after the fact that um, they pluck acorns from oak trees and they store them in dead wood. They start this usually late summer and the fall and they collect thousands and thousands over years of acorns in there. I spend a lot of time making just the right hole for every acorn and they guard them ferociously. Um, but uh, besides the acorn woodpeckers, they have many other organisms who will store nuts and seeds and fruits and berries in, in nooks and crannies in trees, even some insect prey. Uh, to, and those stores can be very helpful to uh, wildlife during winter when certain food sources are less available. And 
you know that decay right breaks down wood and can make little indentations in the tops of trees or even on limbs and those places become anvils for birds particularly woodpeckers to crack nuts um, and seeds and break open, open the acorns but sometimes and um, and uh, to to back, um, break open the exoskeletons of insects to take to their young. And of course, dead trees very often have, uh, living trees do have what we call stress cracks, right? Um, and these stress cracks are wonderful for roosting wildlife, for, for those sometimes birds to nest in there and for thermoregulation. So what we see here is the Western fence lizard. And in this case, we see brown creepers roosting for the night. <clears throat> And the Zerka Society tells us about 30% of native bee species nest in tree cavities. So they also serve insects as well, nesting. And um, then the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection has written a, a report that says that in California, 35 mammals and two amphibians use dead trees and down wood for a variety of reasons. They include the species listed here, Western gray squirrel, flying squirrel, big eared bat, small rodents, sal uh, arboreal salamander, right down here on the bottom left. We have three species of tree frog, the American marten, ringtails, and fishers. So, so we can't leave without uh, that portion of the topic without talking about the value of down wood. So when we have to remove a tree, if we can leave some down wood in place, that's wonderful. And you can see the obvious habitat value of this down log, right? You see the snake resting on there and he's well camouflaged. So that's one nice benefit. And down, down logs help tend to trap leaf litter, which keeps moisture in the ground and allows decomposers to do their job uh, with the leaf litter. And um, what else? Uh, they also, logs also um, reduce runoff and the loss of nutrients. And even logs in places where we live, um, if particularly if there's um, hardwood rot inside, they can be shelter for wildlife and places for them to escape from pred predators. And these logs, particularly if you live in areas that get very hot, we suggest that you put them at least in partial shade, parallel to land, land contours and partially bury them as nature would naturally allow over time. And I, and I can't over, and over emphasize the value of logs across streams and, and rivers. They act as corridors from one part of the habitat to the other. There are also places, places where wildlife can rest and where uh, some wildlife will um, fish in the river or the stream using that log. So raccoons will go in there looking for food and herons and egrets and other birds that eat fish uh, will uh, even bear will hunt uh, from logs across streams. So in nature, this is the obvious, isn't it? Nothing is superfluous. So let's move on to the other portion of my uh, presentation now. So obviously in developed areas, we've changed the land. And so we've had to change the rules about managing dead trees. Safety has to come first. I never argue about that at all. Um, so um, I will say that safety has to come first, but some trees, and forgive all the crazy underlining because this, these are important points. Some trees, not all, in suitable locations, meaning not all locations, can be managed for safety. Some can, some cannot, and retain for a time because trees will eventually fail, either completely or gradually, partially by dropping limbs and so on over time. So we always recommend that a tree risk assessment qualified arborist be called upon to evaluate that tree, particularly if it's going to be in a place with their potential targets. And to find one, you can go to treesaregood.com. As a matter of fact, anything almost tree related is available on that website. But qualified arborists with different qualifications and certifications are listed on that website. And I have two resources that I would like to recommend to you. Um, they're particularly helpful when we're considering removing a dead tree. The one on the left is called Wildlife Habitat Hazardous Tree Decision Model. It gives the tree care provider or the land manager options for that tree other than removing it down to the stump. And the one on the right is a two page document and it, it gives some cautions as to what you should consider and look for and be aware of before you remove a dead tree. And that's 
particularly so in the nesting season, but there are birds and wildlife that roost in cavities, as you know, and so we need to be aware that anytime we go to remove a tree, if there are cavities, there may be wildlife in them and certainly don't want to injure them. All right, so you can find those two resources by going to our website. Our website is cavityconservation.com and on a menu bar up here, there's a resource tab and it takes you those and many other resources. So arborists always want me to convey <laughs> that in reality, there are no absolutes about safety and that not all tree failures can be predicted or prevented because you know, they're, they're, you know lawsuits happen as soon as a tree falls, right? Um, but I understand by attending many of their workshops over the last five years, since I've been part of the tree care industry that long, that I know that is true, that not all tree failures can be predicted or prevented. So let's just mention a couple of situations where we would not want to advocate for a dead tree, certainly not along busy streets where there's a lot of traffic, pedestrians, houses that the trees can fall on. Um, we would not want to advocate for a tree that's been killed by uh, this pest infested, particularly non-native pests. Um, non-native pests can, and can wipe out a species of trees if they're host specific, and those trees have to be removed immediately when they're infested and the wood has to be treated. So we would not, we always wanna ask what killed the tree? Because that's an important question, particularly if a non, particularly a non-native pest killed the tree, because we don't wanna leave the tree in place and, um, and allow the pest times to spread and do more harm. We also don't wanna have a bunch of dead trees at the urban wildlife interface in high risk fire zones, right? Cal Fire is very strict about that in California, it requires a lot of clearance between houses and particularly areas of open space when um, there's a lot of dry shrubby habitat. But what are the preferred locations that we could consider? So I always say the first thing to consider is whether or not, you know, the tree is in a, a location where the habitat is good. In other words, where there's stuff there for birds, resources there for birds and wildlife. So those might be places with lots of mature trees, with lower vegetation, um, dis, uh, spatially arranged, you know, dis, dispersed different heights of vegetation. Um, good habitat, right? You wouldn't want to particularly advocate of a dead tree in a parking lot or an industrial area with this with little for, little for wildlife. It's not practical and the chances are the tree wouldn't be used anyway. In natural areas, in suburban areas, or you know, in even in the urban area, we have these pockets of natural areas, perfect for wildlife trees. And I always have a special interest in looking at the perimeters of habitats, like the perimeters of parks, the perimeters of golf courses. I haven't petitioned cemeteries yet, but I sure would. But anyway, so because it, particularly if there are no trails along there and those perimeters are maybe sloped down and very few people pass by there, in other words, they're very not unlikely if they fail to hit anybody, perimeters are a really good place to save dead trees. Also riparian areas are one of the most beneficial places for dead trees. Many of them do have some already, um, but always recommend for the, the, the retention of dead trees along riparian areas or any body, body of water for that matter of fact, near lakes or ponds, because there's so many birds that hunt over water or hunt in water and they use dead trees very often to perch um, before hunting and to bring prey back. Then, as you know, um, there has to be a certain amount of clearance between trees and power lines. So I would always say, if a tree is in an area where aesthetics is not um, important and objective, then you know, some of these trees have to be very aggressively managed because the wrong tree was planted there in the first place, right? And so they grow too tall. Nobody anticipated the, would, the, the tree would grow that tall and impact the lines. So if they have to be aggressively managed like this one in the center, that is a great time to keep a dead tree rather than remove it completely. And of course, some people, you know, private property owners have larger backyards. And, um, you know, here we see a, a, a short stump here on the right of this backyard. And it's a good habitat, isn't it? Look, I mean, look at the hedges, look at the lower vegetation, look at all the mature trees around there. You know, a private homeowner can, can perhaps have a higher toler tolerance to risk than you know, public um, property manager. And so these are great places for dead trees. If you if you have even just a, a dead tree at a, you know, 10 or 15 feet up, or if you have a whole tree, if your tree falls, you don't have to worry about it, you know, or you can monitor the tree more carefully. So certainly private properties are possible if the conditions are right. 
and then habitat edges. So, um, you know, here, here is, a, this is actually a golf course, I took this, and at, the, at, its, at its edge where it ended, there was this whole, um, this whole row of vegetation, trees and other, other types of vegetation, and they saved this dead tree right here. I was really pleased about that. By the way, these kinds of habitat edges sometimes uh, act like corridors for wildlife to move from one habitat to the next and or to, or to move under cover. Very valuable habitat, so dead trees are very welcome there as well. And this was also taken, I had this on another golf course. I taught these folks into saving this dead tree. The top had actually fallen off, but I, 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 you know, I asked them not to remove this and they agreed because, you know, it was not, it didn't really affect the aesthetics of the course, right? This was sort of more, again, on the outer side of the course, although there's, this is the cart path right here. But what I, what, the reason I wanted to show this picture is that dead trees buffered on either side by living trees have a couple of advantages. One is that the trees, the living trees protect the dead tree from wind right? So it might not blow down as readily. And um, it shades the end of their cavities there that keeps the cavities cooler. And when the youngsters leave the cavities, they immediately have cover to fly into. So very helpful to have a dead tree buffered by living trees. Then, um, you know, if we learn to identify the, the work of woodpeckers, then we will be able to say, well, okay, this tree has habitat for woodpeckers. And so it's a valuable tree, one worth special consideration and attention. So woodpeckers obviously make cavities and you might wanna look all over the tree. Now, they, they tend to favor very often under the, where the limbs meet the trunk and sometimes even underneath the trunk, uh, underneath a limb, but, but look all over the tree for cavities. Then look for what we call woodpecker starts. So um, this is, you know, woodpeckers are obsessive excavators and they're always testing trees to see if you know, the wood is soft enough for excavating a cavity. These woodpecker starts are a good clue that the woodpecker is interested in this tree. It may actually come back from time to time and widen those and test the wood some more. The great thing about these starts is that they let in water and bacteria and fungal spores and they help to break down the tree more quickly, which suits the woodpecker just fine, doesn't it? And then um, you might want to look for holes. You know, as I remember right at the very start, I talked about how beetles infest trees and when they exit, they leave exit holes. Well, so there's a difference between those exit holes of, of insects and woodpecker foraging holes. Now, just understand that there may be exceptions to what I'm saying here. So, but anyway, these, I can tell you, these are woodpecker foraging holes. So when woodpeckers make small holes in trees to go after insects, they use their bill as a chisel. So they're, you know, they're working that hole, right? And so the circumference of the hole is jagged. But if you recall the picture I showed you before, the circumference of those insect exit holes were all smooth. So this is a pretty good indicator that a woodpecker has been foraging in this tree, which says, okay, this tree has value to the woodpecker. And if you look really closely and you're lucky to see it, you know, woodpecker claws, woodpeckers have long, sharp claws at the end of their toes, and they act like pinchers. So they, when the woodpecker is hamming in the tree, those claws, you know, grab that, that decaying wood, that soft wood, and they leave holes in, you know, right beneath the place where they're, because their feet were right here, right where they bore, you know, hole for the insects. So, all right, how am I on time? I threw two, okay. Um, all right, so we wanna consider the site for risk, right, of your tree. So on the left, I have a little warning sign there because this tree is actually de obviously decaying naturally. Nobody's, man it doesn't look like they're managing this area very closely. And you see all the dead wood below. So. If that dead tree has all that dead wood below and it's also adjacent to an area that has a lot of dry vegetation, well, you know, if a fire came along, then that dead wood acts like a fire ladder and goes up that tree and, you know, the fire, the fire can be, you know, worsened because of that condition. So be aware of that. But on the right here, um, here was a tree that was retained, and uh, you can see the building in the back, right? But this is a low use area, and you notice the distance of the tree from the the the, the structure over there. So, um, so 
generally the rule of thumb is that if you think if you think you can allow the tree to fall in place then allow one and a half times the height of the tree for clearance if the tree falls because the tree just won't fall just for and rest its debris just in the you know for the length of the tree the height of the tree but the wood will splatter right it will break off and fly so you want one and a half times uh, the length of the tree circumference for when that tree falls so um uh yeah so wherever there are potential targets you want to consider you know what your toler your risk tolerance level is right uh okay then you know, obviously, you know, as in my very first slide, when I show you mature trees and then trees in all stages of decay. So, so, the, so the goal is, if we want to do what Mother Nature wants us to do, we can, um, it's if circumstances allow, we, we want to retain trees in all successional the stages of decay, right? But the thing is that when trees become what we call a soft snag, which is what right here, a soft snag meaning it's advanced, pretty advanced decay, while it's still standing, no, no bark or little bark left on the tree compared to a hard snag here on the right. See all the bark still there? This tree was managed for a while to save for wildlife. Um, this tree here is a, is a much higher risk to fail and will have less standing time, right? So um, it's a structurally unstable tree and that tree needs to be monitored more carefully, right? And um, it cannot be climbed at this point. You know, when, when tree care providers take down a tree, they climb the tree and they start cutting the limbs and they drop them down by the rope and they cut the top. You know, they do piece by piece. They're climbing the tree with ropes, but they can't do that with a soft snag. So if there's a potential target in the place where a soft snag is, you might want to remove that tree before it fails because no, otherwise you have to bring in big equipment to remove that tree, right? So soft snag, hard snag, they both have habitat value. Now woodpeckers will not use this, this soft snag. They, they will go into the, the harder, um, the, the tree with less decay. Um, but you know, a nuthatch, which is about the only songbird that tr can truly excavate its own cavity, needs soft wood. So it, the nuthatch might, might nest in the soft snag. The only thing is those nest sites, those cavities in that case, um, don't have much protection from the elements or from predators. And so they're very vulnerable. All right, so retain as much as safety and aesthetics allow. So do a, choose the biggest tree you can choose and uh, save as much of it as you can. Just do a crown reduction, right? And leave as much as you in place as possible. And you know, if I were to give a rule of thumb, I'd say at least 12 inches in diameter at breast height and preferably at least 15 feet high. And if you, if you can get the arborist to uh, make a coronet cut at the top of the, the, the stem, that lets, this is for a hard snag, you let water and bacteria and fungal spores in there, which will hasten the decay of the tree. And never underestimate the habitat value of stumps. And I have three very different examples. So I would typically not even consider, you know, asking anyone with a dead tree in a parking lot to save it, right? I mean, that doesn't make any sense at all for obvious reasons. But I noticed this tree right here. I had no decision. This was already here as, as is as I photographed this. Um, this tree was obviously cut down. You can see the cuts of the top, huge tree. When I saw it, there were two cavity nesting birds nesting in there, mountain bluebird and Williamson sapsucker. And I am hypothesizing that the only reason those birds use that tree stump in that parking lot, busy parking lot, trailers and all kinds of cars going in and out of there, was because there was a forest nearby. So always consider the, what habitat is adjacent to your tree. Even if your tree is not located specifically in a great habitat, but if there is a pretty good one nearby, that tree all of a sudden can deserve, you know, warrant some further considerations but I wouldn't suggest parking lots as a general rule. This little stump was about my height, about five foot. And um, it was in an open field tucked between, um, you know, developed areas and, and a, a not all woodpecker nested in here. This was no more than four inches in diameter at breast height. So you see what I mean? Uh, you never know. The small wood, woodpeckers can certainly benefit from a small picky rooney little trunk like that. And this one, I don't know anything about this because I didn't take this picture, but here is a mountain chickadee with a bunch of insects in its bill. And it is inside this stump where there is hardwood rot. 
Now, I don't know if it was nesting there for sure, or if it was just seeking insects inside, but it was certainly benefiting from that drone. All right, a couple of last things now. So if you have a hard snag and, and you wanna hasten the decay, you can drill, take a drill and put maybe a one inch bit in it and drill holes in that tree. You can break off a limb and make jagged e edges to allow decay to get in here. You can protect, you can nail protective covers over exposed areas of decay to create some shelter for wildlife or to nest in there. There are birds that will nest in there. And if you have a stump with, with hardwood rot, you know, decay hollowed out, put a cover and then increase the habitat value of that stump. And um, all we, you know, dead trees, of course, have, um, excuse me, living trees have dead limbs, right? So always consider retaining dead limbs in living trees if it's safe to do so. This is, for me, some of the, this is the, one of the best compromises in urban areas where concerns about risk are so high. So this limb stretched out over a parking lot. It was many, quite a few yards long. And so I talked them into reducing the length of the limb because two cavity nesting birds were nesting in here. I think this was probably about five inches in diameter. Um, but, but it's important to leave some length if you want if you want woodpecker if you want birds to nest in there, because the woodpeckers, you know, uh, not don't just make a hole behind the entrance hole, they go down in down the limb or they go down the trunk, and then depending on the size of the woodpecker and of course depending on the amount of decay in the limb, they need about ten or fifteen inches in depth. And I think this may be one of my last slides here, so you can actually recruit a dead tree. I know that sounds kind of mischievous, but re recruiting a dead tree by that, I mean, you can take a live tree and you can turn it into a dead tree. And a candidate, candidates for this kind of action would be uh, where if you have a cluster of trees too close together where the, the canopy is too dense, and maybe you want to call some of those trees to, to benefit the other, those around it because maybe there's too much um, light blocking or whatever. So if you want to thin a, a grove of trees that are too close together, that's the ideal way to recruit a dead tree, right? Um, or if you have invasive tree species that you're planning on killing, you might want to leave you know, a, a, an invasive tree uh, to, uh, to make, kill it and make it into a snag instead of removing it. So there are a couple of several ways to do this. Um, one recommendation is that you, you cut or reduce the length of about 25% of the limb. So you do a limb reduction. And if you have the time or whatever, you can make jagged cuts here, which hasten the decay as you know now, right? You can actually shorten the tree completely and, and then just do the jagged cuts on the limbs, reduce the limbs, for the lower part of the tree if it think it's too tall. Um, and then you can girdle a tree, right? Remove the bark all the way down to the sapwood, all the way around the tree and that, and then sh um, shorten the, the limbs, some of the limbs above. This, this part of the tree will die first and fall on the ground. So you wanna be sure that if you do girdling, you know, that there is space for this to fall without a bad outcome, right? Okay, and the last thing, how am I in time? Yeah, I did good, Richard. All right, so there, so I always say, if you can safely retain a dead tree, that you put a sign on it, because what does that sign do? That sign tells people that tree has value. It actually, and it describes to them what kind of value the tree provides. And once you do that, you change your perception of the dead tree. And I, and I always say consciousness raising is irreversible. And the Cavity Conservation Initiative sells signs uh, to one, this, this one and a smaller one, just like it kind of. And then another company called Arboriculture International. It's www, I don't think you can read that, arboriculture.international. Uh, he, the, the arborist, he's, he's great at, about saving dead trees. He did his own illustration. He wrote his own sign and he had them made and he sells them on his website as well. A little more expensive, but they're great. So you have a couple of choices there. All right, so what are our takeaways? So dead trees offer ecological benefits a healthy tree cannot. They enhance forest diversity because they allow more wildlife to exist in that forest or the urban forest. Organisms associated with dead trees play important ecological roles. Safety is a priority. A tree risk assessment qualified person should be consulted when necessary. 
right tree, right place, um, pertains to converting hazardous trees into habitat trees. Always ask if the tree needs to be removed completely. Regular monitoring is key when potential targets exist. And our website has many more resources and please share what you learned. Jillian, fabulous job. Thank you so much. That was so interesting and so helpful. And I do want to remind everybody that we will send out a video, a copy this afternoon, and we'll put some of the links that you had uh, in your presentation in that so they'll readily have them available. Thank um, you. We did have some questions during the uh, presentation that I wanted to ask you. And one of the first questions was, uh, how did you get interested in this subject in, in the first place? Okay, so um, first of all, I became a member of the Audubon Society. And a few years, uh, that was about 21 years ago, I've been studying birds and bird biology. But about three or four years into that, I became a nest box monitor. Mm. You know, we're putting up nest boxes to support certain species. And um, it became apparent to me after a few, two or three years of nest box monitoring that there was an unintended consequence of providing nest boxes. And that is that birds, at least the species that we were supporting, were becoming dependent on the nest boxes. And coupled with that, nest boxes are generally cared for, monitored, cleaned out, prepared, all that data collected by old people like me. So old people like me start to have shoulder problems, back problems, we, we, knee problems. And you know, we here in California anyway, we use lifters, right? To lift the, the box up in the tree and down. We were having a lot of recidivism. We, we didn't have people and we had thousands and thousands of boxes. So I had two concerns. One is that we were building an empire of nest boxes throughout the state that we're going to be wanting care or dilap be deteriorating place and being unsafe for birds and unsafe for people. And we were ma making a population, populations of birds dependent on our boxes. And we were so emotionally enraptured with this work because it is extremely gratifying work and it's, it has many good benefits, many benefits as boxes do, but to have, a, we were so enraptured with it that we were losing sight of what the purpose of a dead tree was. Because a nest box can serve a, a particular species, but it cannot provide the ecological benefits that a dead tree can. Mm. See? So I thought we were losing the big picture. So that's why I started the Cavity Conservation Initiative, whose job is really to promote, you know, the safe retention of dead and dying trees, to get people to appreciate the ecological importance of them, you know, and um, so there I am. Yeah, fantastic. Thank, thankfully, there you are. So we, we really appreciate your work. So uh, next question I had, um, your photos, all the photos were just amazing. Now, I've already found myself sending you photos of dead trees. Is this how you get all these photos that people are some. sending them to you now? Or Yes, yeah, some. Uh, whenever whenever uh, people retain a dead tree, I always tell them, uh, you know, please send me a picture, right? Or if people, I get people ordering signs all the time for the trees. So I have a standard letter I send them. And one of the things I see in the letter is, if you wouldn't mind sharing, you know, we'd love to hear, see what you did, and we'll give you a shout out on our Facebook page. <laughs> okay, and that was that was my next question. Do you have some social media you put this out on? So definitely on the Facebook page, you have Facebook Instagram. Page. Yeah, you can too. find a link to our Facebook page on the homepage of our website. Okay. CavityConservation.com. Yeah. yeah. So another uh, viewer was interested in, um, you know, when you do get a tree that dies, who in the world do you call uh, that tells you what killed the tree? Well, you, you would want to call the property owner or manager, you know. So if it's in a, a city park or county park, you ask them what killed that tree. So it would be people in the parks and rec department or public works. It varies from city to city who manages the trees. Right, right. Yeah. But I guess more who's going to diagnose the problem? Who's who's going to be, you know, the person who says, well, it was, you know, a, a boar or something else. Yeah, you know, that, that yeah well, the, 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 if there's an infestation, you know, the, 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 they will know it. I, I mean, usually the tree care providers are the ones, the arborists, you know, specialize in in uh, tree pests and pathogens, they, they can tell. So, yeah. it's a, so it's usually the, the contractor, the tree contractor that makes the diagnosis and then the, the property manager learns. Now it's really, that question is only really important if 
if there was infestation, you know, of non-native pests. Otherwise, it doesn't matter too much. But even if you go to them and you say, listen, I see this tree, it looks to me like it might be in a good place, would you consider saving it? If if it's infested, they'll tell you anyway. You yeah. know, they'll say, we can't save that one, sorry. Yeah. We need okay. to remove it and we need to treat the wood. So they will tell you. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. And then somebody else was asking about the woodpecker over your shoulder. Oh, <laughs> that's my that's my mascot um and i use i i was telling richard earlier on before you guys joined us that um i used to work a lot with children and um in school i don't do it anymore um because i'm too busy with the other program i work for but um yeah i used to use that use it is it strap him around my net my chest and I used to use him to attract kids to me when I had a booth at a community event or something, a nature event, or Arbor Day or whatever. And I had a whole booth to talk about the habitat value of dead trees. And I used to strap him around me to make kids want to come up to me. So that's, that's his purpose. <laughs> yeah, very nice, right? Just maybe they're not going to be that interested in a dead tree in the first place. So but, uh, yeah, <laughs> a great way to capture their attention. Yeah, you know? yeah. So, and then our last question here is, uh, what would you recommend for ash trees that have been killed by emerald ash borers? Ooh. Yeah, that wasn't the easiest question. Yeah, I don't, I don't have an answer because I'm not that informed about the emerald ash borer. So, yeah. That's okay. We don't expect you to know everything about. <laughs> yeah, I, I, but I'm glad you, that's, I'm very I'm grateful for that question. So now I'm going to go get the answer for that question. <laughs> right, right. My, yeah, my arboriculture friends. Yes. Yeah. Well, we're certainly all going to be looking for that. And again, thank you so much for coming on today. Uh, this information was so useful and helpful. We really appreciate it. Uh, and I want to say thank you to all of you who have joined us. Remember, uh, this training and all our trainings at uh, Jane uh, is on our website at janesusa.com forward slash trainings. And uh, as you know, they're all free. We're coming to the end of the year and uh, quite a few of our trainings do qualify for uh, Irrigation Association continuing education credits. We have a section there that uh, is outlined exactly which ones uh, apply for that. And remember, we also uh, are anywhere you listen to your favorite podcasts, we're there too. So uh, it's really refreshing uh, and, and hopeful to me when I know that people are out working and driving from job to job and still listening to our education. So that's always very nice. So uh, thank you guys very much for tuning in. And Jillian, thanks again. My pleasure, Richard. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.